thank you. Um, Okay, I'm Tim Howard. Uh, as someone who spent most of his career as an advocate in the planning world, you'd expect me to have a talk that says planning matters. But I would make clear at, at the outset that although I'm looking at how planning addresses archaeological interest significance, I'm not suggesting that certainly at this point in the time, it has got all the answers. And one of the things I want to do is, is look at some of the potential difficulties that we have got. I'd also say that you know, I'm really happy to be here in Cardiff. I've been working on Welsh planning policy. Um, but this is a, a Historic England session and we've got rapidly diverging uh, planning and legal provision in the devolved administrations. When I talk about planning provision, I'll talk about English provision unless I, I mention otherwise. I, I'd also say, good lawyer, I'll get my caveats in first. Um, I'll concentrate on the terrestrial planning system. Some of you may have uh, uh, maritime context. Bits come up. I'm aware of protected wrecks. We have an overlap in the intertidal zone where we can have scheduling, so it, it is of significance. But I'm largely talking about the terrestrial planning regime, what we call the Town and Country Planning Act in, in old money. And last caveat, I'll talk also predominantly about scheduling. Um, I'm, I'm very aware that there are other assets of national importance that have archaeological interest. Whether they are designated by reference to that or not is a different matter I might pick up shortly. But with that a bunch of caveats, uh, I've excluded most things, let's move on. Uh, I, I've just raced through some of this stuff, apologies, most of you know it. Doff my cap to uh, Pitt Rivers um, and acknowledge that the scheduling system has, has served a good purpose. You know, we're talking about chinks in the armour, but we've got to remember going back 1882, very early, not the earliest, um, but it has served a very good purpose. Again, I'm not going to read all these slides because I know you want your tea. Uh, limitations. What I'd sum up in my usual homespun manner, what I as a lawyer thought, that one of the problems with, with scheduling is what I'd call the crown jewels approach. Uh, pick the best, forget the rest. And that is a very, as I will come on, it's a pretty seductive approach. And, and, and that is why we have had, press delete all of that. Yes, sir. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, you took it off me. Yes. <laughs> That's it. That's the one. That's fine. Can we go backwards? Please? Oh, you're right. That's up. That's okay. Planning. That's the, my, my topic. And I want to pick up, first of all, to set the scene, two largely completing influences. We have got, I'm going to use my own thing so it doesn't, doesn't break things. Top of this, uh, basic principle in planning law planning should not simply replicate other regulatory regimes. If you're doing a waste scheme, you don't go into the minutiae of whether you need a waste permit because there are other, there are other mechanisms to sort that out. Now, that runs up against, when we come to the second bullet point, a, a largely competing consideration. Planners have got to work out what is relevant. We have, you're probably all familiar with it, the notion of a material consideration. Now, that's, that's ultimately decided by the courts. Uh, the courts, however, have taken a pretty inclusive view, if you look for trends, of what's a material consideration. Usually when there's a challenge and the court looks at it, they err on the side of caution. They say, yes, it is, and when we're looking at cases at the extremes, you know, the social implications of bail hostels, that sort of stuff. They say, yes, it is a material consideration, but a matter of discretion for the decision maker or the inspector, <coughs> and in this case, a, a matter of little or no uh, importance, therefore, although it's material, it makes no difference to the decision. And, and, and that means, you see, we have two competing factors there. Look at almost everything and don't get bogged down with, with things that aren't planners' concern. Most of you will know the Hoveringham Gravels case. Uh, one thing I would say, if you're going to do any background reading after this, you get it with law students, you always read the, the head notes. Um, and I would say, like, Crime in multi-storey car parks, you know, wrong on so many levels. This is a case which is interesting <laughs> on so many levels. Um, the, the head note in modern language, it wasn't the old language because that's back in 1975, that case. So actually before the 79 Act and a different procedure. We had notices then. We, I wasn't doing it then. But uh, 
Uh, Stella Cast, Lord Denning, Lord Scarman on the Court of Appeal, Ian Glidewell represented Hoveringham uh, later in the Court of Appeal, and Malcolm Spence, former lead, future leader of the bar, represented the Secretary of State. Uh, it's about that place. Um, Berry Mound, Iron Age Fort, had a lot of mineral under it. It's a compensation case, funny enough. Uh, I could speak all, all day about it. You don't want me to? I'll, I'll just say, the compensation issue was this. Was it agricultural land worth £100 in 1975? Or, or, or was it land uh, that could be exploited for mineral use, uh, therefore worth £75,000 when you value? The case came down. Please read it, because you want to see the arguments and the way it developed. Um, case came down to, hypothetically, could you get planning permission to level that scheduled monument, which is what it was. Most of you may think, absolutely no way. Lawyers would not think that. Ian Glidewell put forward the argument, hang on a minute, we already have a regulatory regime to deal with scheduled monuments. You should not be looking at the archaeological interest or the national importance in statutory terms of uh, Bury Mound Iron Age Fort. That is irrelevant in planning terms. Therefore, give us £75,000. Uh, Lord Denning and Chums saw through that and said no. Uh, again, the, in modern money, the impact of development upon the historic environment is a material consideration. I won't go through the, the highways and byways. To me, extremely interesting, possibly not to you. Um, they also said, they were talking then of, of national importance. They also said as a throwaway line, and it would have been the same if it was of local importance. So that's where you get the fact that we're not just looking at, at, at designated assets. But we had the principle established then that, that planning law and practice could come to the aid and fill in the void that we had left by a, what I would term a crown jewels approach to what we now call heritage assets. So we had the principle there, but that principle was only... Um, see if I press the right button. That principle was only actually developed its detailed application actually in planning policy. Why has that happened? Well, Steve touched on it in a way yesterday. All of you, I'm sure, are aware, 2008, 2009, we had an England and Wales Heritage Bill that was going to bring us really into the 20th or 21st century with a more thoughtful, significance-based approach to dealing with the historic environment. We all know it, it crashed and burned. And I thought, I have to say, I remember, and some of you may have been involved in it, immediately after that happened, English Heritage, as you were, put out a statement saying, we can achieve 80% of what was going to be in the bill. And I thought, ho, 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 why have a bill if you could have done it that? But take my hat off, I think you've got a fair way towards doing that. But I just note, and, and again, I could turn right at this stage and, and, and spend the session talking about terminology. Just note that we've got some tension between statutory terminology, national importance, and planning policy that's developed significance. Now, there is a way through, and I think uh, chatting to Roger and uh, agree, archaeological interest comes up on both sides of the equation. Uh, again, we could investigate that. But I would just note, national importance is a threshold above which the Secretary of State then considers whether to exercise a discretion to, discretion to schedule. Significance as it's developed in policy is a scale. Yeah, everything's on it. And that's the new list. Yeah, we, we don't just look at the crown jewels, we look at everything. So bear those things in mind when we're dealing with it. And how did we develop policy? Well, the crucial notion, the heritage asset. Again, uh, I've been really complimentary about people, probably because I'm on, on camera. <laughs> This definition, <laughs> this definition's got Mike Harlow's fingerprints all over it, and it's a definition I really like. It's a lawyer's definition because it's gloriously circular. Okay, we have this question: How do you define quickly what is of significance in the historic environment to consider in the planning system? So. The answer we give, I won't read it all, you can read it yourself. The answer we give is, oh, it's a heritage asset. So you ask then, what's a heritage asset? You say it's something of su sufficient significance to consider in the planning system. Oh, that's where we started. <laughs> that's brilliant for a lawyer because it's a closed definition. 
there are no loose ends there. It is completely done. You see, now in Wales, when we're talking about this, they're saying, well, let's discuss what, what in Wales is still a historic asset. And again, with Nolan in Scotland, it's similar. And they've got a descriptive definition. Well, what's going to be a, a historic asset? Well, monuments, lithic scatters, and similar features. As soon as you get that in, of course, the lawyers rub their hands with glee. There's another thousand pounds on the bill. Because, well, what's a similar feature? You've got a grey area. So, that I like. I, I did try and persuade Willem that we should have that in Welsh planning policy, but, but at the moment, we'll see what comes out after the input, at the moment there's a more descriptive definition of historic asset. So uh, without wiping the... Oh. <laughs> I should just go through them. Could I? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's going up by that. I'm going. not paid for technology. Avoid that square. That square button. All right. Would it help if I... Yes, yeah. please. <laughs> <laughs> um, developed it through the National Planning Policy Framework. Just say at this stage, we all worried about this. And you tend to, in, in professions, look at what can go wrong. I think... The sector, historic England, English has got a lot right with DCMS in this. Um, we got in as a core land use planning principle. Again, I just noted passing. Planning should conserve heritage assets in a manner appropriate to their significance. A, a, a very good concept. Next. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's significance? It's defined there and includes archaeological interest. And now we've got a significance-based approach. Let me just say, I'd said statute, said policy. I should know we've got English Heritage's uh, conservation principles, which provide a lot of the philosophical background to this working out of policy. We've got evidential value, historic, aesthetic, historical, aesthetic, and, and, and communal. And we've got, uh, just flag up here, archaeological interest, a, a key concept. You're well aware of it, but in my sort of homespun language, we've got this to we've got historic interest, which is what we know, and we've got archaeological interest, which is what we may find out. And there's a significant difference there, and some of you have grappled with it, have got these notions. Again, as Casper was saying, when we're talking to colleagues who, who don't spend all day thinking about heritage assets, it's the sort of issue that we have to be careful to, to, to unpack. So, thank you. <laughs> um, and just finishing off uh, my canter through the background to policy, you'll be aware in planning policy, traditionally, and it's no different in the historic environment, there is enhanced um, uh, protection given to designated assets. Paragraph 139 puts non-designated assets of demonstrably equivalent significance on a similar par. So there, with a very brief counter through, I would suggest we've got a logical framework with which we can defend, potentially, Assets designated or undesignated. <laughs> Success. <laughs> that couldn't go for too early. Um, uh, not quite. Because remember when I went to Hoveringham Gravels, it was thought at the time that that had banished the notion that we shouldn't be looking at the historic environment in the planning sphere. What I'll go on to suggest now is that the spectre of that notion actually still haunts some aspects of planning, law, and practice. So, so um, this is where we come to. Funny enough, you, you won't recognize it. This is the last major inquiry I did, which was the East Sussex and, and Brighton um, waste inquiry. Six months, uh, a, a very pleasant, uh, incinerators with a hot topic, New Haven and uh, and other things. And, and I just put this, that's me there saying, am I right or am I right? Yeah, I say figure of fun. The, the protesters, God bless them, did a calendar with, with many caricatures, this is one of them. I just put it in, because it shows all the, metaphorically, competing considerations as transport down there, landscape, economic factors, a, a whole host of things. Uh, again, put bluntly, dare I say, in a six month inquiry, there's an awful lot of ch chaff and not a lot of wheat. And if I could move to the next slide, please, uh, Deborah. Again, doubt is not a pleasant condition. In decision-making, clarity is essential. And in decision-making, having too much information can be as dangerous as having too little. 
And remember, planning is essentially a comparative exercise. If you get lost and overvalue the significance of something in one inquiry, there isn't necessarily a direct correlation, but you can bet your bottom dollar somewhere else is going to suffer because development takes place one way or another. Um, so I just pause with European directives. Natural environment is quite different. Rigorously defined procedures which give them uh, an, an added advantage in, in, in dealing with matters. And I just note there, from quite a few years' experience, archaeologists are very good, I feel, at, at dealing with the notion of, of, of development. It's change, it's transition, it's, it's in your DNA. Ecologists and other natural environment practitioners don't have the same philosophical background. Their usual response to a concern is to say no to development. You know, a Dartford warbler flew over two years ago, and you can't develop that shopping <laughs> site. You, you laugh. I've spent days and days arguing about whether you can put alarms on cats to stop them getting there. Three days arguing about that. You would not believe the way. Um, and, but, but, but let's be honest, it makes the natural environment lobby very strong. Because if you don't give any ground at the outset, you're not on any sort of slippery slope. Now, that's not a criticism. Good luck to them, and I think we, there's things we could learn. But it's just a note when we're. And that's the designation provides a simple and enticing answer. If it's two o'clock in the morning and you're in a six month inquiry and you've still got to deal with economic issues that you've got to cross examine somebody on, you want to, and Casper picked it up, you want to say what is designated. You want order out of chaos. And you don't want Duncan or whomever coming to you saying it's not as simple as that, Tim. Oh, it's a, yeah, it's, it's, you want to simplify, and there is an advantage. So this isn't a theoretical concern, it's a practical one. Casper touched on it, that if you're not careful, this can be what happens in practice. Um, uh, doubt is not a pleasant condition, but certainty is absurd. Um, if you want to know who said that or don't know, look it up like me on Wikipedia. Um, I'll say here, I'm... I think the his, Historic England <laughs> project is an extremely valuable one. I am extremely supportive of it. I, I almost go as far as to say crucial. Um, these are some of the caveats, though, that I think you've got, to, and, and we've touched on it already. <laughs> be, we've got to be careful about what we can and can't do. Certainty, well, we haven't got a statutory provision. And you've got to be careful and be aware. If you've got a scheduled monument, you can argue about the nature and extent of the national importance, but it's there, it's scheduled. If you're not careful, you'll be unpicked your methodology about how you've, how you've used a, a mechanism to identify undesignated national importance. You'll be compared with other, other local authorities who've done it slightly differently. I think something we've got to take into account. Um, exclusivity, of course, the unknown in archaeology, which is something that, that planners and other professionals find difficult to get their head around. Yeah. What's there? Well, we can't tell you, really. <laughs> we could investigate and we have an idea. Again, go back to the inquiry. It's not music to someone like my ears when I hear that. Um, but the Crown Jewels approach, we talk about lists and registers. My initial concern, and I, and I think this project could address it, is that yeah, you had in football in terms of the Premier League, and if you don't get in the Premier League, you're nowhere. Well, the worry is that you, you make lists up and you make a second division, a championship now. And the question, you, move, you just widen the goalposts. It's pick the best, but the best is now the Premier League and the championship, and you, and you can't do that, so you've got to be explicit. Um, the extent to which they reflect community views, I'm not ignoring the uh, yeah, conservation principles, the importance of a bottom-up approach. Yeah, the days when, the, when it was a man, the man from the ministry told you what was important, have gone. Um, but there are problems with that. Um, as a lawyer, I found over many years, local communities' perception of value is conditioned primarily by their perception of risk and threat. And that's not even when development proposals are on the table. I, I'll give you one quick example. Um, Alton, 20 years ago, uh, extension to uh, the settlement, Greenfield, lots of arguments about urban fringe, Greenfield development, extending settlement facilities. It was a field that Sweet Fanny Adams was killed in. Uh, those of you who know me would know that the inquiry was more Frankie Howard than Tim Howard, but, <laughs> but to the local people, that was really important. It wasn't a reason for refusal, 
and no material remains. I think after 150, it was a gory murder, for those of you who know. I think, yeah, there were bits of body all over the field, but I don't think even our forensic colleagues would find anything 150 years on. <laughs> but for them, and when you step back, what their problem was, was they didn't want a housing estate at their back garden. But they latch on to, well, Fanny Adams was murdered. You can't. And, and again, I did lots of local plans. Won't go into the details. Third parties didn't have a right to give evidence. It was you and the developer. So I'd often get asked when I was representing local authorities, can you just call a representative of the local group? And I often said no for this reason. Their, their evidence was often diametrically opposed to the county archaeologist. Yeah, grade two listed building, grade two starred, nah, demolish it, build a crash. But Fanny Adams, she was murdered there, so we'll have an exclusion zone between, between Alton and Farnham. And of course, that was direct, the, the developers loved that, because they said, well, you've got to ignore all that evidence. It's, it's, the council's evidence is completely contradictory. So, again, just a word of warning that there are issues with local, I better move on. <laughs> um, quickly move through to planning permission, just remembering planning law related to the land and related to development. Um, the colleagues from Scotland might recognise the Adelaide that was a listed building um, in the Scottish National Maritime Museum on the slip at um, Irvine. It was affixed to the slip and listed building consent was given to, I don't know if they is disconnect it from the slip. I had maritime colleagues then emailing me, we want a judicial review. How can they, of course they put it on a barge bound for South Australia as the sea shanty goes. Um, <laughs> We've got to judicially review this. They're taking a listed... I said, it's not a listed building. It's no longer affixed to the land. It's gone. It's halfway... You know, you haven't got territorial jurisdiction any longer. It's in the South Atlantic. But interesting. <laughs> interesting point. Um, sorry, I'd I better rush on through. Um, I, I want to... Uh, we have definition of, of development, operational development, change of use. Um, agriculture is expressly agricultural activity and forestry activity many of you will know expressly de excluded from the definition why Dinnington and places like that suffer from plough damage just pausing to note there that's a problem for scheduled monuments as well because of class consent now I haven't dealt with class consent but there's echoes of it in the permitted development bits that Casper Press is now and Press now come to so I've just know probably some of you more familiar than me with uh, plough damage and, and the problems so I'll, I'll skip on quickly for that just picking up Permitted development. This is my two minutes, that's quick. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll speed up. Permitted development. This is the major issue I've got. Picking up permission, you know, can be inquired on application by anyone, and that's when we look at the hovering and gravel material consideration. Pursuant to an Act of Parliament, HS2 is the, the big thing now. Lots of issues about that and national importance. No, no time to do it. Pursuant to a development order. Um, as of, yeah, I think government, to honour the first day of the uh, CIFA conference, brought into force a new GPDO, 2015. <laughs> what you used to refer to as Article 1.5 land now becomes Article 2.3 land in England, not in Wales. Um, and that's land which is environmentally sensitive. It doesn't include scheduled monuments, which are at times excluded specifically. Why doesn't it exclude scheduled monuments? Well, the thinking may have been, why do you need to uh, worry about permitted development rights? You've got to apply for scheduled monument consent if you're going to go in. So we get this spectre creeping back in that although looking at, at planning applications, you, uh, you have to take into account non-designated and permitted development is, is slipping under the radar. So if I just move on quickly. Homes behind homes, you may remember it. Uh, government 2013 extending amongst other things um, the right to build extensions it used to be three and four meters back from your home depending on uh, detached or semi-detached it moved to six or eight meters if you if you total up the ground area that's quite a lot and caused us and others algae up quite a lot of concerns because if I could just move to the next please oh sorry, I'll stick on that. because where you have had continuous development, you've usually got a lot of scheduled monuments, conservation areas, and so on. Conservation areas are included within what was Article 1.5, now 2.3 land. When you get places like Sirencester, they have discontinuous development. So you had early Roman stroke medieval development, and then a big gap 
And you've got 20th century development on top, often quite nondescript. It's largely undesignated. You know, you've got few scheduled monuments. And that's a real problem because you've got really important, potentially, archaeological remains under there. We made a big pitch on this, and the answer from government was Article 4 directions. Um, their directions issued by local authorities to withdraw uh, permitted development rights. And require clear justification, if I could just slip to the drawbacks. These aren't my words, it's quoting um, Clive Betts, chair of the CLG committee in 2012. Regarded by many as cumbersome, time consuming and expensive, may require the payment of conservation. Interested in these cash strap times, planning applications which have to be submitted, certainly it's always used to be the case, if you have an Article 4 direction, you don't have to pay a fee when you apply for planning permission, if you're made to apply for it. Um, I would add, those, that was the evidence recorded by the government committee. There's been quite a lot of research, I think our RPS did some work back, say, 2008. There are hardly any examples of compensation being claimed on this case. But it has not stopped, particularly in an archaeological context, local authorities being resistant to change. Shall I quickly run in yeah, two yeah. minutes? Uh, I'll, I'll quickly scan through. Article 5 directions, just to note, that used to be Article 7. Uh, so it's minerals. Um, they have a slightly different procedure and they introduce site of archaeological interest, which if I can just go to the next one, is a site, land which is within a site registered in any record adopted by a resolution of a county council and known as a county site. That's quite an interesting tool. In England it's only used in min effectively in minerals. In Scotland there's been a greater uh, willingness to broaden that out and I think the scope there, conservation areas, definition there. Note architectural or historic interest. There is a lot of archaeological influence in there, but I'd suggest it's about things we know, street, street layout and known knowledge. If I just move to the next one, uh, it's old EH guidance, which, which was helpful. I'll just move on from there. The question I have, in many cases, archaeological material can be taken into account. But go back to Sirencester. You've got potentially very significant remains under there, but it, it's a nondescript 20th century housing estate. I would suggest it's never going to be made a conservation area. How do you protect that if you don't get Article 4 directions, which we've been missing? So that's a question for the future. Uh, plan making proposals. Casper picked up. I would completely um, endorse those. Just be aware, when you're looking at allocations, I did this all the time, you have a little bit more time than I've had, but you've got a couple of hours to deal with a, often a massive site. And what go, it's done at a very high level. And when there are issues, oh, well, subject to further archaeological investigation. But what happens is it's been identified and it develops a life of its own. But the last, the last slide, but policies are helpful. And I think things like embedding, if we have lists, mechanisms, uh, methodologies and registers, Embo embodying them and giving them some status through the planning process would be really helpful. That's Southampton, another uh, uh, inquiry I did many moons ago. Uh, I think, next? Conclusions. <laughs> uh, just stress the importance, I feel, of this program. It's not a substitute for legislative reform, but can ask, act as a catalyst for further development of policy and practical initiatives to see that, that assets are all managed in, in a manner appropriate to their significance. Um, I'll be available if anyone wants to ask questions at coffee time, but thank you for your indulgence. <laughs>